Well, take your Bibles and turn today to Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19. Either your Bible, your iPhone, your iPad, uh, your Samsung device, whatever you have. Exodus chapter 19. And today we're going to be looking at the first nine verses. So as you find that, let, let me state that there are certain things that naturally come before something else. Let me say that again, and then we'll kind of uh, play a game together to see if you're following what I'm talking about. There are certain things that naturally almost always come before something else. All right, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to name something, and I'd like for you to tell me what comes after that, all right? Let's see whether you're, you're getting the drift of what I'm talking about, okay? So dinner comes before Dessert, right? What did everybody say? Bed or uh, a nap or something like that? The evening news? All right, so, so dinner comes before? D- there you go, there you go. First grade comes before? Second grade. I thought somebody would yell out third grade or fourth grade, which would have been a true statement as well. But first grade comes before second grade. Thanksgiving comes before? There you go, you're catching on now, all right? Exercise and diet generally come before? Weight loss, there we go. Boy, you guys are doing it, all right? Life comes before? Death. The playoffs in football, excuse me, in football, the right, I gave you the answer. In football, the regular season comes before? The playoffs, I thought unless you're the Dolphins. And then there's several regular seasons that come before the playoffs. All right, Dolphins fans, don't get on me. I'm a Dolphins fan. I know we made the playoffs last year, but uh, we got to give them a hard time. All right, so you get my drift today, all right? Many things in life are naturally ordered so that they come before or after something else. That same principle is found throughout Scripture. God has a natural order of events. Read Genesis chapter 1, and you'll see that, that the world was created in an orderly fashion. There were things that were created the first day, and then the second day, and the third day. There was an order, there was a structure to God's creation. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 5 says that he created the night before the day. Sometimes when we think of a day, we think of a day as morning and evening. But when God thinks of a day, God thinks of a day as evening and morning. Read Genesis chapter 5. He talks about the first day. He says, and evening and morning were the first day. God has an order of events. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4 tells us that Jesus came in the fullness of time. In other words, he came at the precise time in the precise order of God's plan. God foreordained and God planned the arrival of Jesus Christ, and he came at just the right time. I see all of that because in today's passage, we clearly see that God has a divine order that we frequently mess up. Let let me say it again because even as religious leaders, we have a tendency to mess it up. God has a divine order that we tend to mess up. Here's what I mean, and it's the title of our message today, Grace always comes before the law. Grace comes before the law. We have a tendency to invert that. We, we want to emphasize the law before we emphasize grace. And here's one of the ways that that plays out in our life. We want people to change. We see a family member of ours who is living in a way that doesn't please God, that doesn't honor God, and so we, we, we want them to change, and so we have a tendency to remind them, here's what the Ten Commandments say. You shouldn't lie. You shouldn't commit adultery, and we, and we name whatever sin they're committing and the law that God has established that they are breaking. And so we want them to obey the law, But as of yet, they have not experienced the grace of God. 
Yeah, yeah. You see, here's what we see all throughout Scripture. Justification always comes before sanctification. Grace comes before the law. And when we mess that up, when we mess up God's order and God's plan, man, man, man we're in a precarious position. It's not our place to do that. I don't want to get ahead of myself. We see that illustrated in the passage of Scripture that we're looking at today. So we're in Exodus chapter 19, the first nine verses. Follow along. We'll put it up on the screen if you didn't bring your Bibles today. Exodus 19, 1. On the third new moon, here's what that simply means, three months after the children of Israel had left Egypt. On the third new moon, after the people of Israel had gone out from the land of Egypt, on that day, they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from Rephidim and came into uh, the wilderness of Sinai and encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain. While Moses went up to God, the Lord called out to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shall you say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, verse 4, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. If you underline in your Bibles, that's a great phrase to underline. How I bore you on eagles' wings, and I brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So Moses came and came down from the mount and called the elders of the people and set before them all the words that the Lord had commanded him. All the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Listen, that's, that's a preacher and a pastor's dream. <laughs> to stand before the congregation and say, here's what the Lord said, and for everybody in a unified voice to say, we will do everything that the Lord tells us us. All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. I find it interesting that, that the text even says that because God is omniscient, right? And he, and he knew exactly what the people said. And, and yet Moses takes back, he must have been excited as a pastor saying, God, you're not going to believe it. Everybody responded to the message. Everybody said, whatever God says, we will do. And the Lord said to Moses, behold, I am coming to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with them and may also believe you forever. Would you pray with me today? Lord, as we look at your word today, I pray that the Holy Spirit of God would do in our hearts and lives what we cannot do. Lord, help us to, to understand the text, but not only understand the text, but I pray that you'd help us to individually and corporately respond to the text. I pray that you'd help us to be gracious believers instead of legalistic believers. I pray that you would help us to be believers that hear your law, hear what your word says, and we respond with a sincere heart. Lord, whatever you say, that's what I, that's what we will do. Lord, I pray if there's somebody here today that has never experienced the grace of God. Maybe they've heard about the law of God and they've experienced legalism, but they've never really experienced the grace of God. I pray that today they would understand how very much you love them and the desire that you have to demonstrate your grace, your mercy in their heart and in their lives. We thank you for what you're going to teach us today, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as we read through those first nine verses, you, you might have noticed something. You might have said, well, well, Brian said we're going to talk about grace, and yet the word grace is not found in those nine verses at all. Did anybody think about that? Did you notice that? Man, we're talking about grace, and, and, and grace is not found. That's true. The, the reason being, not because the Bible doesn't talk about grace, it does talk about grace, but, but grace is best demonstrated. Uh, grace is better lived out. And, and that's what God does best. God frequently and God magnanimously demonstrates 
his grace to us. Let me just pause for a second and let's Let's define grace. What is grace? And you probably have heard of of different definitions of grace. One of the definitions of grace that we use frequently is an acronym. I think we'll put it up on the screen, an acronym, grace, taking the, the, the five letters in the word grace and saying grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. You might have heard that before. That's a, that's a good definition of grace. Others have defined grace as unmerited favor. In other words, God God granting us favor, God giving us things that we do not deserve. And by the way, all of us here today are the recipients of God's grace. Doesn't matter whether you're a believer, whether you're a devout follower of Jesus Christ, maybe you're here today and you just don't believe in God whatsoever. That really doesn't matter because all of us here today are recipients of God's grace. You say, Brian, what do you mean? The Bible says that the sun rises on the just and on the unjust. It it rains on the believer's house and it rains on the unbeliever's house as well. God demonstrates his grace to everybody. Grace is unmerited favor. The definition that I liked as I read many of this Many of them this week was uh, made by a Dutch theologian named Louis Burkhoff who defined grace this way. He says, grace is the unmerited operation of God in the heart of man, affected or made possible through the agency of the Holy Spirit of God. So, 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 so here's what he's saying, uh, you know, big definition, but here's what he's saying, grace is the fact that God is working in your heart. Grace is the fact that that the Holy Spirit of God takes the Word of God and and makes it effective in our heart and in our mind. Many of you here today would claim to be followers of Jesus Christ, and we rejoice in that. You're a follower of Jesus Christ not because of your own initiative, not because you're smarter than anybody else, or you're more religious than anybody else. You're a believer today because of the grace of God, that God worked in your heart through the operation of the Holy Spirit, bringing you to a place that you realized your need of him. Grace is the unmerited operation of God in the heart of man. There's not a single one of us here today that could raise his hand or her hand and say, I deserve to be a believer. Why, I was raised in a Christian home, or I was born in the United States of America, or I am just an overall good man, or a good woman. None of us deserve what we have received in Jesus Christ. All of it is unmerited. God gives it to us by his grace. So here's the question as we look at Exodus chapter 19. How does God demonstrate his grace in this chapter? How did God demonstrate his grace to the Israelites? And for us today, how does God demonstrate his grace to us? Let's kind of dive into the passage and see how God did that to the Israelites and then apply it to us. The first thing that I wrote in my notes, if you have your outline in front of you, is this. God demonstrated his grace by taking the Israelites through the desert. Let me say that again, because that's not gonna initially make sense. God demonstrated his grace by taking the Israelites through the desert. Now, most of us have been here for the last six months and we've walked through these first 18 chapters of Exodus, but uh, if you haven't been here, and even if you have, let me visualize what I'm talking about today. I, I wanna put a map up on the screen, all right? So that is the traditional route of the Exodus. Just to put things in order, Egypt is on the left, Goshen is where the Israelites were in bondage to the Egyptians. That, that middle place right there, that V is called the Sinai Peninsula, and Israel, or the promised land, is up in the right-hand corner. You can see the Dead Sea and Jerusalem and Hebron and Beersheba, all those lands of Israel. Now, you would have thought that God would have taken the Israelites the most direct route from Egypt to Israel, right? That makes sense, all right? When we go from here to Orlando, we plug in our GPS, and we want what? We want the most direct route. You would have thought that God would have done that, and there were actually two paths that they could 
could have taken. There was the route that was the way to the land of the Philistines, and then there was the way to shore that went through shore in the middle of the Sinai Peninsula. But that's not the way that God took them. As a matter of fact, the red line, can you see, can you see the red line? All right. The red line is the traditional route that we believe that the Israelites took going from Egypt to Israel. Now, you read that and you immediately notice what? They kind of went out of the way, did they not? And even if you'll see, as we're reading here in Exodus chapter 19, they're clear down in the bottom underneath the wilderness of sin at a place called Rephidim. They're in between Rephidim and Mount Sinai. Now, here's what I want you to catch. At this moment in Exodus chapter 19, the Israelites are farther away from the promised land than when they were in Egypt. From a distance point of view, they're not getting closer to the promised land. They're getting farther away from the promised land. And not only that, but now they're not going through the beautiful conditions that are on the Mediterranean coast, but now they're experiencing what? They're experiencing deserts. They're experiencing wilderness conditions. Now, naturally, the Israelites would have sat back and said, wait a second. I thought you were taking us to a land that was filled with milk and honey, a land that was green, a land that was plush, a land that had everything we could desire. And right now, we find ourselves in a place in which the conditions are not getting better, they're getting worse. God, you promised to take us to the promised land, but it seems like we're going in the wrong direction. Let me just pause for a second and ask you, have you ever noticed that trajectory in your life? You sit back and and, and you understand the truth of the gospel. You realize that you desperately need Jesus in your life. And so there's a time in your life where you, uh, where you repent of your sins, you give your life to Christ, and at that moment you think, okay, everything is going to get better from this time forward. And what happens many times after we surrender our lives to Christ? Life doesn't get easier, life gets what? Harder. You surrender your life to Jesus and it seems like life goes downhill after that. We see that throughout the Bible, experience after experience. Problems abound, trials increase, and it's easy to get discouraged. God, what in the world are you doing in my life? Have you ever asked that question? Maybe not out loud, but you've at least thought it. God, what are you doing in my life? God, I've surrendered myself to you. I want to serve you. I want to honor you. And God, it seems like it's gone from bad to worse. Claudio, my, my Argentine friend, had a Spanish saying that said, va de Guatemala a Guatepeor, eh? Our Spanish-speaking people understand that. It goes from bad to worse. Here's the truth that I want you to catch, and we see it here, and you're going to see it in your life as well. You have to go through the desert to get through or to get to the promised land. Catch that today, church. You got to go through the desert to get to the promised land. The path of the Christian walk rarely takes a straight trajectory. God allows us to climb mountains, and God allows us to experience the valleys, the deep valleys of life as well. We experience the good, and we experience the bad. Here's what Job said. You know the story of Job. Here's what Job said in Job chapter 2 and verse 10. Shall we receive good from God and shall we not receive evil? And And so we make the statement that God intentionally had the Israelites go through the desert in order to get through the promised land. Why was it gracious on God's part for Israel to go through the desert? Why was it gracious for them? Catch this today. It is in the desert where their faith was tested. It was in the desert where their faith was strengthened. 
You and I have seen that even the last few weeks, just in Exodus chapter 16, 17, and 18. Over and over again, the Israelites experienced a crisis. And what happened in each of those crises? One time they were with, or twice they were without water, and once they were without food. They had this crisis, not only of water and food, but they had this crisis of faith. God, where are you? And they cried out to God, and all three times, what did God do? God came to the rescue. And God gave them exactly what they needed. They literally experienced the power of God and the provision of God on a daily basis. God allowed them to experience those things in order to strengthen their faith. Let let me show you some verses in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 2 through 5. We'll put them up on the screen. Moses is talking about this wilderness experience, and he said, and you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you, and he let you hunger, and then he fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know The man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothing did not wear out on you, and your foot did not swell these 40 years. Know in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. Listen, here's what God wanted the Israelites to know and what he wants us to realize very simply is this. God desires to take us through the promised land, but, but that is not always a path of roses and good fortune. God will take us through the deserts, and it is those desert experiences that strengthen our faith and help us to become the men and women that God want us to be. And so I put this in your outline. Your life, your life and my life, your life is filled with desert experiences that God has allowed in order for you to grow in your faith. And I get it, every week I sit down with people in our congregation that are going through a desert experience. They have a health crisis, they have a job crisis, They have a family crisis. They lose a loved one. Something happens in their life that doesn't make any sense to them whatsoever. And if they're not careful, it's easy for us to throw our hands up in the air and say, God, what in the world are you doing? Why are you leading me through the desert? And we need to realize that it is those desert experiences that God will use to help us become the men and women that he desires for us to be. James says it this way in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know, notice what he says, that the trying of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. God uses the resistance in our life to strengthen our spiritual muscles and to help us become who he desires for us to be. How many of you enjoy going to the gym? All right, a couple of you. The rest of us, what? We endure it, right? Oh my word, I gotta go to the gym. All right, I gotta gotta lift those weights. Listen, You don't get muscles like I have just by sitting around the house and eating peanut butter and jelly and watching football, all right? Yeah, somebody recognized that, thank you. All right, you gotta what? You gotta gotta pick up the weights. And what happens when you pick up the weights from a physiological point of view? Man, man, you lift a lot of weight and it kind of tears those muscles, it hurts. But then you go to bed at night, you get a good night's sleep, and what happens? The next day, those muscles have not only uh, restored themselves, but they're stronger and they're just a little bit bigger than they were the day before. How do you grow more muscles? By resistance training. That's the only way that it works. Why would we sit back and expect it to be any different in our Christian lives? 
Why would we sit back and say, okay, God, here's the deal, man. I want to eat, drink, and be merry. I want to put my feet up in the air, watch television, and you grow my faith. That's not the way it works, church. To get to the promised land, you have to go through the deserts. God demonstrated his grace to the Israelites by leading them through the desert. Let me show you a second truth in the passage. God demonstrated his grace in the selection of the Israelites as his chosen people. Notice verse 4 once again of Exodus chapter 19. You yourselves have seen, God says, what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and I brought you to myself. In other words, here's what God is telling the Israelites. You didn't do anything for your rescue. You did absolutely nothing for your redemption. I graciously chose you. I graciously selected you. I graciously redeemed you. I graciously rescued you. And I bore you on eagle's wings. And I brought you to myself. That's a demonstration of God's grace. Now, now here's what I want you to catch. And I put this in your outline. God's purpose of redemption was to bring the Israelites to himself. Did you catch that in the passage? Verse 4, once again. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' rings and brought you to myself. God powerfully and providentially protected and brought the Israelites out of Egypt, not for the purpose of them necessarily experiencing the promised land, but by taking them to himself. Church, I want you to catch this. This is such an important spiritual truth. God's ultimate purpose for your life and mine is not that you and I experience the blessings of the promised land, but that you and I experience him. Well, that was a little weak right there. You know why? Let me tell you why. Because we all just want to experience the blessings of the promised land. And we want the blessings of the promised land without Jesus. And you cannot have the promised land without Jesus. Man, be careful. I don't say a lot about this. Be careful what you listen to on Christian television. Because sometimes it's all about the promised land. It's all about what God can do for you. And, and that's not what God desires. God's desire for you is not to make you and I healthy, wealthy, and wise, and to give us everything that we want in this life. God wants us to experience him. He wants to bring us to him. If I experience prosperity, if I experience wealth, if I experience all of those things, but don't experience Jesus, here's what I am. I'm a rich, lost man. I'm a prosperous lost man, but I do not know Jesus. Moses said, God did so many things for you. He bore you on eagle's wings. He rescued you from Egypt to bring you where? To bring you to himself. And catch this, church, God, God met with Israel, not in the promised land, but he meets with Israel where? At Mount Sinai, he meets them in the desert experience of life. And I'll tell you today, some of your deepest, some of your richest experiences in life, some of your closest conversations with God will not happen in the milk and honey of the promised land. It'll happen in the desert. It'll happen when your life is dry, when your life is dreary, when you have no idea what God is doing. And there in the midst of the desert, God comes down and he meets with you as only he can. That's a demonstration of God's grace. And he demonstrated it to the Israelites and he demonstrates it to you and to me as well. His ultimate goal for you and me is to have a relationship with us. God brought them, he redeemed them 
for the purpose of bringing them to himself. Man, the question I have for every single one of us today is this. Not are you experiencing the blessings of God. Here's the question I have for you today. Do you have a relationship with him? That is the most important thing. God's ultimate desire for you and me is to have a relationship with us. And it's sometimes only during the deepest, darkest moments of our life that we realize that. And that's a deep truth. We could stay there all day long. Let me show you a second thing in the passage. Israel's response to redemption was to obey God. Israel's response to God's grace, Israel's response to God's demonstration of unmerited favor was to do what? Was to obey God's law. Verse 8, they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Now, I know what you're thinking because I thought it too right after I read that. Boy, they didn't keep that promise very long. <laughs> Did they? I mean, I mean uh, God, I promise you we'll do everything you want us to do. And by lunch, we've forgotten the promise. And, and we're doing what we want to do. All you have to do is read the Old Testament. You're going to sit back and say, my word. They didn't keep that promise very long. But here's what I want you to catch. In spite of their inconsistency, when they made that promise to God, God wasn't naive. God wasn't up in heaven sitting back thinking, okay, finally they surrendered themselves to me. Now they're going to give me their all. God knew exactly how unfaithful they were going to be. But in spite of their inconsistency, God was consistent. In spite of their unfaithfulness, God was faithful. He always is. Here's what I want you to catch, church, and this is, this is deep stuff. Put your thinking caps on and allow the Holy Spirit of God to teach you today. This is deep stuff. Acceptance always comes before obedience. Acceptance always comes before obedience. Let's flesh that out for a second, can we? If I obey God because I'm scared to death of him, if I obey God because I'm scared that fire is going to come down from heaven or I, I read, you know, the Ten Commandments as we're going to start studying next week or I read the Sermon on the Mount and I see all the things that God wants of me and I oh, obey him before I've really accepted him, I'm obeying him out of what? Out of fear. I'm obeying him out of fear. If, if, if obedience comes before acceptance, if obedience comes before grace, it's just a, a fearful response. But if acceptance comes before obedience, if I realize all that God has done for me, and in response to his gracious acts of mercy and grace in my life, if I then say, oh my word, God, you've done so much for me. Here's the way I respond to you. As the Israelites did, we will obey your word. That's a demonstration of what? Love. Amen. God, God, you've been overly gracious to me. I obey you not because I have to, not because I'm scared of you, not because there's this judge up in heaven that's sitting back shaking his head at me all the time. And, and, and this is really important because as evangelical Christians, we have many times an erroneous view of God. We have the idea that whenever we sin, God's up in heaven going, oh, I'm so disappointed in Brian. I'm so disappointed in Vicki. And, and, and there is, I do not minimize the holy aspect of God, and we're not, we're gonna see in a second, we're not gonna lay aside law, but law never functions correctly without grace. God always responds with grace. Grace comes before law. Let me just park here for a second. Because I think one of the reasons why we are unsuccessful in evangelism in this day and age is we emphasize law over grace. We see somebody who's living a lifestyle that doesn't honor God and we immediately want to judge them and we want to take them to this passage of scripture that, that, that condemns their lifestyle. 
And at that moment, they don't need law. At that moment, what do they need? They need grace. They need grace. They need to understand that there's a God in heaven who loves them in spite of who they are. They need to realize that there's a God in heaven who loves them while they were sinners. We have this idea in our minds that we have to change before we can really give our life to God. And we've messed up the order. You cannot change yourself. I cannot change myself. Sanctification is not something that I can do or you can do. It only happens when we respond to the grace of God and we allow the Holy Spirit of God to come in and indwell us and fill us and he's the one who changes us. For some reason, we've, we've messed that up, church. And I'm not just talking about us. As evangelical Christians, we have messed that up. Jesus spent the majority of his time, obviously with the 12 disciples, but he spent ample time with publicans and sinners and prostitutes. And when he was with them, I guarantee you, he wasn't quoting them, making them memorize the 10 commandments. He was loving them. Grace always proceeds, proceeds law. Romans 5, 8, God shows his love toward us. While we were sinners, Jesus died for us. Let's just put this in perspective today so you understand this. Let me give you a couple of big words today, okay? First of all, to place the law before grace is legalism. To place the law before grace is legalism. To, to make somebody change before they understand the gospel, it's not going to happen. To tell somebody, and moms and dads, man, we're guilty of this sometimes because we see um, our kids are going the wrong direction. We want to bring them the back, dire- the, back the right direction, and so we pound them with law. And as I mentioned before, they will never change till they understand the grace of God. And when they understand the grace of God, they then will change. To place the law before grace is legalism, but catch this, to, place, to have grace without the law is antinomianism which is just a long word for freedom to live however you want. There has to be what? There has to be a balance of grace and law. Here, God doesn't tell the children of Israel, I've chose you, I've bore you on eagle's wings, now go do whatever you want. He says, "I've, I've chosen you. I have bore you on eagle's wings. You are my possession. Now let me share my law with you. Grace without law is antinomianism. It's just the sinful freedom that some people feel. And we live that in our society today. And if we're not careful, it's easy for us to, to, to chase the pendulum on one di- in, in one direction or the other instead of having balance. There must always be a balance of law and grace. But grace must precede the law or we mess up God's plan. We see that here in the passage. As we continue dissecting this passage, let me just mention God promised to give the Israelites three blessings. We see that in verses five and six. He said, now therefore, if you will indeed indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all the peoples for all the earth is mine. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. He promised them three things. He said, first of all, I will make you my treasured possession. The the word that is used, the Hebrew word that is used there is really interesting because because Most kings had large government wealth. If you read anything, you know, in the Old Testament, you realize that Solomon is the king of Israel, had coffers filled with gold that basically was the nation's gold. That's not the word that is used here. The word that is used here speaks of personal wealth. And and so here's what God is telling the Israelites, and we'll see in just a moment that he's telling us, you become my personal possession. You become my personal wealth. He said, you'll become secondly a holy nation. The idea being that they would what? They would live out, to put this in New Testament perspective, that they would live out the truths of the Sermon on the Mount. 
The idea of the Sermon on the Mount is God is basically telling his kingdom citizens, here is the way that I want you to live. I want you to be a holy nation. Here is my pattern that I want you to follow. He says, thirdly, you'll be a kingdom of priests. The idea of the priest is that they had what? They had access to God. And so Moses tells them, listen, God loves you so much, and so God has given you his grace, and he's given you his law, and here's what God desires to do for you. He desires to make you his treasured possession, to make you his holy nation, to make you a kingdom of priests. Now, if you know the New Testament, you sit back and say, boy, that sounds like a verse in the New Testament, doesn't it? It does. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, Peter takes the same principle And he applies it to us. He says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. We saw this last week. So that you might proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Listen here, that's what God desires for you and for me as well. God desires for us to respond to his grace And as we respond to his grace, we see his law, we understand his law, we apply his law, and as a result, God's blessings are manifested on our lives. The last thing that I wrote in my notes is this, God's order of grace throughout scripture is always the same. God's order of grace throughout Scripture is always the same. Here's here's, here's what I mean by that. We have a tendency to think in the Old Testament, people were saved by works, but in the New Testament, they're saved by grace. That, that, That simply is not the case. All throughout Scripture, God's people are are redeemed and sanctified the exact same way. What, What transpires? salvation. There is a redemptive act of God which results in faith, which results in salvation in the life of the individual. That person gives their heart and life to Christ, and as a result, they begin to respond to God's word, and they begin to obey God's word. Why? Because now they're believers. Now they've experienced the grace of God, and their love and their, and their commitment to Jesus Christ is demonstrated by now a passionate desire to obey him. And with obedience comes blessing. As we take God's truth and we apply it personally to our lives, God's blessings are manifested in our lives. I kind of put it this way a little bit in, a, in, in just a formula that we can understand. Grace, salvation does not begin with us. It always begins with God, always. Grace, we respond to God's grace by faith. God then reveals his law, and all of a sudden, we begin to understand God's law. You you get that. Now that you become a believer, God's word makes more sense to you, does it not? Why is that? You have the Holy Spirit of God who's living within you. You have that great teacher who's living within you. Now you can understand what you previously could not understand. Why is that? That's God's order of events, grace, faith. God reveals his law. And when we realize there is a holy God who loves me and cares for me, my natural response to that is what? Obedience. I obey him. And as a result, God's blessings are on my life. Now, that's once again, that doesn't have to be financial blessings. It could be blessings in a variety of ways. It could be the blessing that God takes you home to be with him. But God's blessings follow obedience. So so let's ask you two questions today as we close. Two questions. The first is this. How are you responding to God's grace? How are you and I responding to God's grace? Did you ever do something for somebody and they never said thank you for it? I mean, you went out of your way and you sacrificed, you did something for somebody and they never expressed any gratitude whatsoever. They never thanked you for it. They were completely ungrateful. 
Isn't that the way we respond to God sometimes? God has blessed us more than we could ever imagine. And our response is not one of obedience, but our response is one of ingratitude. And our life never changes. How are you responding to God's grace? I put the application in your notes. Our response to grace should be to live a life consistent with his commands. We don't live that life in order to be saved, in order to be believers. We're already believers. We have already experienced the grace of God. As recipients of his grace, our natural response should be to what? To live a life that is consistent with his commands. How are you responding to God's grace? Let me just ask one more question to this. What do you demonstrate? Are you gracious in the way that you treat people? Or are you the the law enforcer the way that you treat people? You'll never reach your family for Christ by pounding them with the law. The law doesn't save. The law is powerless. The law only shows our need for Jesus. So we reach people, what? By being gracious, by being Jesus to them, by loving them and treating them just as God treats us. The law will come. As they become believers and they desire to follow Jesus Christ, man, the truth of the law will come. But let's be dispensers of God's grace. And let's see how God uses us. Grace before the law.